as I showed you guys on the board a second ago, we were talking about uh, Isha and Isha. So when God made Adam, he called his name Ish. Aleph Yod Shin. That's God's first letter of his divine name. He took, as we call her Eve, she wasn't called Eve. She had no need to be called Eve until she started bringing forth children. Then she's called Chava. Chava also is life, but it's not the same kind of life as Chaim. Chaim is God's life. Chava is, she's a mother of life, which is natural life. Okay, she is called Isha. This here is the word fire. This here together, that makes the word fire. The Yod and the He, put them together, you have God's name. They had the spirit of Almighty God living in them. God had to guard the way of the what? The tree of life. The tree of life is called Eitz Chaim. Chaim is spelled simply like this. It's a Chet Yod Yod Mim. Chaim. He breathes in this guy, Eitz Chaim. And then he says he became a living soul, which is really interesting because then he singularizes that he becomes a living soul. Why? Because now he's referring to Adam as one particular life. But when he actually takes Eve out of there, what's interesting, Adam talks about her being bone of his bone and flesh of his flesh. Now, it's a huge argument among scholars. Some say that she come from a rib. Others say uh, the Chabad organization, which I'm a member of, uh, which is Hasidic Jews, say that it was actually half of the side of Adam. But what's interesting, though, when you read about it in Genesis, I'm just doing this to save time. When we read about this in Genesis, Adam talks about her coming from him, from Adam, uh, uh, from his flesh part. But then he makes an interesting statement. Then he says that she was taken from Min Ish, from this part right here, which is the very fire of God inside of him. So it's the scripture in Hebrew. You have to understand, when we read it as Jews, it makes more sense to us. We can see what it was that they had. We understand it. That's why when Jesus was on the earth and he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, he claimed to be the tree of life. He claimed to be the way because they were trying to figure out how to get back to the tree of life. We knew we needed to live eternally, but we didn't know how to live eternally. So we didn't know the way back. And here comes this man, Yeshua, and he says, I am that way. I am the truth. The truth is in me, and I am that life. Now, if God took Eve from within inside of Adam, and she comes from that fire of God that was in him, and God makes another being that's a fire of God, or another person that's filled with the Holy Ghost, then we must have a type of that 2,000 years ago. We call Jesus, we call him the second Adam. Is that right? He comes to fix the problem that happened that, that Adam messed up. I know a lot of the guys want to blame Eve. But God said by one man, sin came into the world. Okay? But he wanted to fix that. God wanted to fix that problem, so he sends Yeshua. But where is the type of the bride? You ever think about that? Where is she at? If Christ is a type of Adam, then there must be a type of Eve, and it must be that she is filled with the Holy Ghost when she comes out of the womb. And John the Baptist is a type of the bride of Yeshua. He came from his mother's womb filled with the Holy Ghost. Now I'll give you something to think about. We'll go on to that in a minute. So, the role of women in the Bible in the first place. And because we have all kinds of doctrines that we have in the world today, and you have to understand, most um, people that go to churches, including ministers that, that study in, in the universities, etc., would not know any more than anybody else other than what they've been taught. And so, but when you begin to dig deeper, 
you can find out the truth of what, of, of what the Word of God actually does say. So if you take, for example, when God created Adam, he made him from the dust of the earth. But when he breathed in him, ipach, ipa'av, or vepa'av, nishmar chayim, he breathes in his nostrils the very breath of God's own life, and he becomes a living soul. What gives him the life is God giving a portion of his own life. That's what makes him eternal. But when he made him from a clay figure, you know, when he breathed in his nose, he wasn't just a clay figure any longer. It wasn't just a, a hunk of clay, and God breathes and wham, it turns into a human being. And I think that sometimes it's the kind of the image we get in our minds that it's just a lump of clay. He made the body from the dirt of the earth, from the clay of the earth, but so are you. You're made from the dust of the earth. How are you made from the dust of the earth? Everything you eat comes from the ground. And your body, your cells have multiplied as a result of the food that you eat. If you eat beef, the cow eats the grass, the grass eats the bugs and junk in the dirt, you're eating dirt. You're basically, you're made up of the dirt. It's your biology. You're from the earth, okay? <laughs> yes, and she's a biologist, so she knows these things. Uh, she's also a nurse midwife, so she knows all that kind of stuff. She's pretty good on these things. Uh, smart old girl. That's why I made her, because I didn't have no brains. <laughs> there goes that table. So, uh, But anyhow, so what happens is God creates this man, and he breathes his own life into him in a plural form, not because that when they have children, all their children are going to be filled with the life of God. I, at first, when I began to study this, I wondered that, was that the case? Well, if that was the case, then there would be no need to guard the tree of life. They wanted to go protect. See, God had to guard the tree of life so that they would not come forth and put forth their hand to the tree of life and live forever. That was their descendants. But you have to remember, when God gave a command that they were multiply and replenish the earth, God doesn't break his word. He said this to the fish of the sea. He said this to the fowl of the air, to the, to the animals on the land. Multiply and replenish the earth. We see God keeps his word to this day. Everywhere you look, there's still remultiplication. Even mankind is remultiplying. In fact, if you think about it, I know some people ask, they, 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 you get the question asked, you know, do you believe that there will be my dog and my cat in heaven? And some people say, that's absurd. There's no animals in heaven. Heaven was for humans. He rode out on a horse, and all the angels come out with horses. Uh, there is a lamb, and the lion will lay down, and the lion ain't going to eat that lamb anymore. Uh, okay, now we can get into all those there, but... Here's one, though, that most people don't tell you. When Adam and Eve sinned in the Garden of Eden, the animals didn't sin. There was, God had no death in that garden. They were meant to live forever. All he told them to do was multiply and replenish the earth. That's all he said. And actually, the word in Hebrew does not mean replenish. So it wasn't like it had life on it already. That's not, it's really a poor translation. In other words, populate the Fill earth. The earth. Fill the earth, exactly, not replenish. That's a bad word, bad translation. Uh, see, simple little things. You get the people that don't know Hebrew, and they see that word, oh, man, replenish. We had another civilization. It was Martians before, and God decided to put us here. No, it has nothing to do with that. So anyway, they never fell. But they're reaping as a result of mankind because God had put him over them. Now, here's another thing to think about. God give Adam and Eve both dominion over the, all the animals, including the fish in the sea. How can you have dominion over fish in the sea unless you can go there? But that's another thought altogether. But the main emphasis is, though, is he gave them dominion. Not him dominion, but them. So both the man and the woman had the dominion, and they had the full ability to go and to lead and to rule the animals of the earth as well as, the Bible says, the fish of the sea. 
Maybe this is why the people at SeaWorld love the fish of the sea and want to go swimming with them. So somehow or another, they had that ability to intermingle with them, no doubt. But anyway, when God makes, the, the, makes Eve, he takes her from, as the Bible says, mean ish, from the very fire of God that is inside of Adam, and he makes isha. And he doesn't have to breathe in her nostrils, as we talked about earlier, and how John uh, the Baptist actually types Eve. He comes from his mother's womb filled with the Holy Ghost, just as Eve come from the, not from the womb of Adam, but from inside of his being. Actually, she comes from the womb of God, because God has put his life in there, and the Bible says from that part of the life, he made her life. Bible in Hebrew does not say rib, by the way, okay? And no. I want you to know that originated with Pharisees and, and uh, it was a Jewish community. As you know, they had a lot of oral traditions mm -hmm. and they made up, oh, she must have come from a rib, and then they made a bunch of laws that were not God's laws, and then they portrayed women as less, and they truly ruled women and over women, patriarchal society. Even to this day, Jews are praying and thanking God, male Jews, thank you for not making me a woman. Yep. You know? That's exactly right. But that's not in a God's law. This is just their made up traditions. And Yeshua, when he was on earth, and he talked to Pharisees and Sadducees, and he was saying, you made with your traditions God's word of no effect. They had a lot of traditions we, that's and right. they lived by that. And still, we still have it. This yeah. is where we have the oral law. That's why we have a Talmud. That's why we have a Mishnah. That's why we have a Midrash. And they're not God's word. No. But now here's the thing, though, that's interesting. And even as Rabbi uh, Nechami Gordon says, that they, they're, they're writings of the patriarchs. It would be like myself or the brother here, the, 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 writings, that he, the writings that he writes, commentaries on the Bible and stuff. Our words are not the Word of God, per se. Technically, we're not the Bible. But we're writing our opinions on what we see written in the Word of God. Are we fallible? Sure we are. We're just men. We're no different. Women do the same. They write on it as well. And what we're going to, to show you today, it doesn't make one greater than the other either. But we're going to get into how God created things and what Yeshua did in the restoration of bringing back life back to mankind. Now, as Yana was saying, this began with, uh, it was a Pharisaic law from an oral tradition. But oddly enough, in modern days, the, some of the Orthodox Jews, and now they debate this, they debate that that oral law was wrong and that in reality, that we weren't made from a rib, now we was made from half of Adam, or the women were made from half of Adam. But there is some truth to that, because he doesn't just say, mean ish, from the fire of God does he make her. That's the part that makes her feel with the Holy Ghost. In other words, the Holy Spirit is imparted into the other body from within. But he also says, mean ha'adam, which is from the flesh part of Adam. That's what made the DNA of her body. Basically, he took some physical part, DNA, from him, but it wasn't rib. That's just, um, that's just conjecture. That is really, really old. And it was made up by rabbis. Okay? Uh, but anyway, uh, do you, do you want to say something more? The, yeah, we'll go just a little bit. We'll go a little bit further. Okay. And so we have her. She comes forth. Then the fall comes in, and when the fall comes in, I think this is important, this is something we didn't discuss before, is the fall itself. And that's important in order to understand redemption. Because you can't, redeem, redemption is to bring something back to its original state. So first, that's why we start off with how God created man and woman, so we can see how God originally created you. Now, we get into a very interesting passage here in Genesis. Um... And, and, it, and I find it fascinating because the way it's translated into English, even in Jewish Bibles, makes it look as if there's an inferiority, even in the translation. But if you read it in the Hebrew, it's not an inferiority. And here's why I find it interesting in saying this, because... Many rabbis in the writings that they do in modern time and even in older times, 
they always talk about when God created Eve, he did it with great deliberation. He deliberately designed her and took more care in making uh, Eve than he did with making Adam. And they even, rabbis will say that God created them equal. There was no difference in them. But where the rabbis take the twist is when the fall comes. Then they say that God says that, you know, you, you listen to the voice of your wife, and so therefore you will rule over her. Now you're her boss. Now, before I tell you, when I read this to you here, I want you to think of the logic of this. First, a lot of people try to blame Eve for the fall. That's what Adam did. Adam says, the woman you gave me, she did it. She's the one who did it. She did it. She gave it to me. And I just got, he didn't say suckered into it. But, you know, he blames her is what he does. Because he's scared. Once he's failed, fell from grace, just like she fell from grace, he's scared. She's scared. They both, they both fell. They're hiding. They're sewing fig leaves together. You know, I always said, you know, people say, I wonder what the fruit was. I said, it must have been figs. They were sewing fig leaves together. I don't know. It's just a little joke I have. But, but the thing is, the Bible, though, what's funny, though, is even though Eve does what she does, Eve does not intentionally sin. That's the big difference. Adam intentionally did it. Regardless of what he did it for, he intentionally sinned. That's why the Bible says, by one man, sin came into the world. It doesn't say anything about a woman doing it. When God goes to the serpent, or go, goes, you know, Adam goes to Adam first, he passes the buck to his wife, and then she says, the serpent beguiled me. She just tells the truth. Now, the rabbis tried to say that she made a major mistake. She said that God has said, thou shalt not eat of this tree. And God never spoke to her, only spoke to Adam. If that's the case, how come God didn't correct her then? He doesn't. Well, I wanna go ahead and address it. You can address now, that. Because this is a Bible I got from my husband when, he, um, when I was converted. I was miraculously converted. And I would like to say that story in short. It's a okay. long story, lots of details. And we won't have time, but I do want to, especially for your sake, because I have a sister here that was in the same shoes as I was, and I believe that maybe that's the reason we have this conference. At least I can bless you. Thank you. And, um, but I want to tell you that when my husband got me this book, we used to read from New World Translation. That's a completely different book. That's the book that Watchtower Organization has printed, and this is the Bible that they know as the only true Bible. So I was really excited. He even put my name on it, saying I was so excited. Um, Yeshua came to me, you know, very supernaturally. And I, I will tell you all about this. But then, um, as I am reading, I'm reading commentaries. You have to understand, I had to learn everything from beginning. I had to take doctrine of Jehovah's Witnesses one by one and unwind it from my brain and kind of put the real good doctrines and the real truth here and here first. And it was just the most tedious process for me. All I knew when I got converted is that Yeshua is God. I called him Jesus at that time. I didn't even, my husband used to call him Yeshua, but I really despised it because we were such enemies. You know, we were enemies because of religion. So I always called him Jesus on purpose, which is fine. It's perfectly okay to call him Jesus because that's his name in English. In my, in my language, it's, uh, do I'm I need just this? Trying, yeah, I'm trying to record you. Go ahead. Oh, in It'll my, pick you up. Just don't whack it. Oh, in my <laughs> language, it's Yezish. In, in uh, Spanish, it's Jesus. So some people are very legalistic about his name, but I, I'm, you know, I'm perfectly okay with Jesus. And, but I know his name is Yeshua. That's what Mary called her, her little boy. She was a Hebrew woman. So she called her him Yeshua, right? Okay, so I'm reading commentaries. And here it goes. Uh, Genesis 3, 2, and the woman said to the serpent, we may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, Eve says, God has said, she, notice she refers to God, 
not Adam. She doesn't say Adam said. She says, God said, you shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. So I'm reading my commentaries because I'm learning everything from the beginning. I needed the milk, literally milk, okay? And here it is. Satan began his conversation with the woman by questioning God. The woman distorted God's command by adding her own interpretation. Nor shall you touch it touch it lest you die she was exaggerating in hopes of making god's directive restrictive and to appear unjust this is a comment this is the king james bible okay so here i am reading this and i was horrified and the rabbis also said take the same idea. i said so what does it sound to you like Oh, she was awful. Just, oh. And she was even fallen yet. <laughs> she didn't eat of the tree, but she already added to God's word and made him look unjust. Do you understand? How's anybody calling me? <laughs> Is this dead or odd? That's what I oh. thought. Okay. T it's my take, take one second. Let me pause it for one second because I don't want to lose any of this. And he'll freak out if I don't take it. Okay. Hello? I do believe in submission. Hello. Obviously. <laughs> and I'm not, you know, because Hello. I, I have been Ditto. called Jezebel. And, uh, you know, hey, myself. we're at the hotel, but we're in a but meeting right now, okay? I'll, uh, <laughs> you go ahead and go to sleep, but we're okay. Okay, <laughs> and the kids are okay. Submission. That's different. There's a difference. Okay. I'll, I'll, I'll call you in the morning, because as soon as we got I here, we had to start. All right, love you, Ditto. It's a very big subject. Because there is about five or six scriptures that is used by patriarchal. The least you can do is at least give us those scriptures. Before you go, let's mull over them. Yes, okay. yes. Oh, it's, it's very deep. It really is. Well, keep but in mind, because we are late at night, too, so we I know. want to go. I know. I just. Okay. So basically, Eve is blamed by commentators uh, before she eats the fruit as a perfect woman as adding to the word of God and making God look unjust, just like really awful woman. Now, you know that what it is to add to the word of God. That's mm -hmm. not a nice thing. And he will deal with you if you do. So I know with Jehovah's Witnesses, they add and take away from the original word. They're going to be facing God and they will, they will be judged for this. They're leaders. Right. Okay. <coughs> so Don't what say. I want to say about this is that I started really questioning because I was surprised. I really saw that Christians have all truth now. And I went from one extreme to the next, and I thought, ooh, they know it all. So I started thinking, well, is it really true that she added to the Word of God? Because if she did, then I am sure God would talk to her about it and say, you sin, not only by eating the fruit, but you sin by adding to my to my word and making me look unjust that would be awful sin but he never tells her that right. and you know why they say that no god doesn't always give every detail of what he wants a person to do as far as in the written down as far as like i could find it easy to believe he also said don't touch it because when you touch something you're more likely to take it exactly but you see why they say that they say that because their teaching is that God doesn't deal with women one-on-one. -on -one, and they're teaching that all of her instruction was given to her by her husband, who is her leader and her head. Right. But what they forget, that God has a personal relationship with women, and he talks to them. Okay, now. And if he has a personal relationship with women in a fallen state... <laughs> I'm not finished. Talk to the hand. <laughs> Just this one. I want to okay. read because I'll forget. All right, go ahead. If he has a personal relationship with ladies in this state as we are right now, how much more did he have a personal relationship with a perfect woman? Well, he Amen. With them both, so exactly. He that's walked right. with them and talked. So she says, I believe Eve, because that's before fall, and she says, God said, I believe he talked to her. She was his daughter. And I believe that he instructed her 
just like when Yeshua was on earth, you know how he loved Mary? He says he loved her. And how he instructed his female disciples that one was sitting at his feet and the other one was saying, come on, help me in the kitchen. But she, he said, what? Oh, no, she chose a better portion. Better. Okay? So uh, I believe that God Sorry. had personal relationship with Eve. And I believe she said the truth. God said. And I, I really don't believe these commentators here. You see, they're blaming our Mother Eve. Yeah. Our Mother Eve is blamed so and portrayed in a horrible picture. And it goes deeper even later, later, later. Genesis 3.16, if you just knew what it really says in Hebrew, it doesn't say, I shall put enmity between you. No, I shall cause you. What does it say? Let's read it. Genesis 3.16, it's translated in King James, which I think it's the best Bible out, out of all translations. I just think it needs clarification in some places. Uh, but 3.16 isn't translated correctly from Hebrew. Genesis 3.16, it says here, to the woman, he said, God said, that's what they said, I will greatly multiply your sorrow and your conception. I want to tell you, God does not cause sorrow. He does not. He's that, he does not do that. And before this verse comes up, God said that he's going to put enmity between the Satan and her and her seed and his seed. But first he said enmity between you and his serpent and between your seed and his seed. Where did God put Eve? He put her on the right side of the equation. Mm -hmm. He didn't put her as his enemy. If she's an enemy of devil, that means she's a friend of God. That's right. And do you think that right after he puts her on the right equation side, he's going to say, oh, but now I am going to cause you sorrow. That's not what the Hebrew says. Hebrew says the snare. The devil shall cause you sorrow. Amen. Yes. I taught her well. <laughs> it says the snare has now caused you sorrow. And it's a statement of consequence. It's not a divine ordinance. God is telling her now what will happen to you. See, the snare has caused you sorrow. And this is what <clears throat> will happen to you. And what's happening in the whole story of Genesis here is that mine. <laughs> <clears throat> what happens in Genesis, though, is that God is prophesying is what he's doing. He's prophesying of the events. And seeing she's jumped to that part right there, let me, let me take you to that. Um, and uh, let's see here. That's what happens to us when we talk together. We forget if we don't jump in, then we forget what we want. Right, right where she's talking about, in, in verse 16. El ha'isha amacha debel araba. This is where he is saying, he is saying to her here, unto the, unto the woman he said, I will greatly... Well, that's, that's well, not We know that it's, right, it's not translated correctly there. It's talking about the, the one that's going to... The, the one the, in waiting, the snare. The, the, the serpent is who it is. The serpent. one that's in waiting. In fact, it's funny because the serpent's name, Nachash, that's how we call it, Nachash. Nachash is one that is at rest. Mm -hmm. The one that is in waiting. You understand? The one in waiting. He's, that's where he gets his name. His name is actually, it's from the Paleo Hebrew is where we get this. If you take Nachash and break it down in Paleo Hebrew, it is one that lies in wait and it jumps out yeah. the way a snake is. Now that's in the Paleo Hebrew in the actual symbolism that we have there. That's what Nachash is. And so when it says the one that is lying in wait, that's exactly what it's speaking about the serpent. So why do they translate it correctly in the Proverbs? But they don't translate it correctly here. That That's was right. Manipulating. That's right. Now, we have done really, you know, we named this ministry Dinner <clears throat> Institute of Biblical Research for one reason. We research really deep. We go deep and we research. We want really the truth out. And we don't have truth in everything. I mean, I want you to double check on everything. 
because you are responsible in front of God one-on-one, -on -one. not because he said, she said, or Chuck Missler said, or Perry Stone, or Steve Danoon. You have to go to, you listen for edification, you listen to your brothers and sisters, but then, and those who have a, you know, fivefold ministry, teaching ministries, the last, mm -hmm. okay, well, listen to them, but then go in front of God and really check on this because you are responsible for yourself. Mm -hmm. But uh, yes, they translated it correctly in Proverbs, okay, and in Numbers. Mm -hmm. And in lots of other places, but here it's manipulated to make it look like God is causing sorrow and putting some curse on Eve. And he didn't do that. Okay, who did this? You want to know who? It was Catholic Church. It was Catholic Church who changed it and deliberately controls it. They changed a lot of things. Yes. And they've manipulated a lot of things And I don't know if you're familiar with Dark Ages and, 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 and Hunts for Witches. Did, I, did you ever hear about that? Okay. Yeah, that goes into that. That's right, Brother But Paul. you know what? There is a time period when Catholic Church, the Satan, the enemy of a woman, really went after women, and they would call them witches for any mark on a body or if they tried to uh, use herbs to help uh, in medical issues women during labor and all that so they call them witches they still do that in the churches right now if you use essential oils and things it's like you're the snake lady yeah yeah so, some exactly of them, not, yes. so there is that spirit some, some coming no, out no and watchtower is big in that too yeah they don't like natural cures yeah. and well, so basically neither does obama <laughs> yeah, That's right. Obamacare. <laughs> you see, Watchtower doesn't say anything against Obamacare. But, but, yes, and they went after them and they killed over 60 million women and girls. Mm. Oh, wow. Burnt them alive at the stake. Mm. And by the way, it wasn't only just for that, it was also if they, if they had any types of visions or dreams that God would actually use supernaturally, mm -hmm. like Joan of Arc. Mm -hmm. She's a very spiritual woman, led the French Revolution, everything, and look what they did with her. Mm -hmm. They burn her at the stake as a witch because she protested the Catholic Church. Yeah. So exactly. now, <clears throat> before we continue getting off like that, you say, I go on a rabbit trail. Boy, you go on a rabbit trail, all right. <clears throat> let me just clear up, let me clear up one. That's the right one. <laughs> I sure do that a lot myself. <clears throat> We're just excited by the Word of God. Yes. And our Father in Heaven and Yahshua on the side. When it, when it says here, though, what is actually happening? I want to first get this so we don't, so you get the main picture of what happens. God is prophesying in here. First off, He doesn't say, you shall bring forth children in sorrow and in pain. The word pain there is not for physical pain. That, that's what I'm getting into. Okay. Glory to God. Hallelujah. <clears throat> what that is, when he says in here, first off, he says, Teledim Benim. Teledim Benim means you will birth sons. Mm -hmm. We just translate that loosely as children. Ben in Hebrew is son. Benim is sons, plural. Teledai or Teledi is you will birth. The tav in front is for her being the you part. Dim, teledim, ladim, ladim is to birth. Banim, she's going to birth sons. God's prophesying to her. And he talks about how that the one that lying in wait will cause you sorrow. Because why? She's going to have sons and it's going to cause her sorrow and pain. Why? Because God knows that one child is going to raise up and kill the other child. That's right. And one, she loves them both. The sorrow comes from the death of the one son. The sorrow, the mourning at the grave, etc. The pain <clears throat> is because Cain, whom she loved as well, her own son, kills him. This is a prophecy specific about Cain and now, Abel, not of all women of all times no. getting cursed in childbirth. Let me, I just right, want let me, to know that. Yeah, and that's the thing. So it also shows... <laughs> in fact, that, that, that kind of deals with the issue of an epidural. So if women can get an epidural, then so I guess the curse applies if you take it in that regard. That's not what, he's, that's not what it says, though. It's the, way you, it's the way people are trying to translate it. But it doesn't end there, though. That's the whole thing. <clears throat> and um, so because also, if we back, back up just a little bit, <clears throat> and he says to her, 
And to the woman he said, this is in verse 13, Assume, and the woman said, The serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. And the Lord God said to the serpent, Because thou hast <clears throat> done this, thou art cursed above all the cattle. I'm just taking the regular translation. <clears throat> and, above, uh, and, uh, and above every beast of the field, and upon thy belly shalt thou go, the dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. <clears throat> and I'll put enmity, which is hatred, between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. And it, sh and, and, uh, it, it shall bruise thy head, thou, and thou shalt bruise his heel. But here's where he says, And to the woman I said, I will... Uh, as we already know that, we know about that, and then you bring uh, the, the, the children come forth, and he, here's the key. And yet thy desire shall be to thy husband. <clears throat> and Hebrew says here, he says, Ve'el ishach, and to the woman, and actually he doesn't call her Chaba either, he calls her Ishach. Or, ish, or excuse me, Ishach is her husband. And you, it, it says, and to your husband, Ishach, I'm sorry, I get my brain mixed up here. Ve'el Ishach, Tushuktecha. Tushuktecha. <clears throat> You're not going to see this in modern Hebrew language, but if you go back to the ancient biblical Hebrew and you begin to research Tushuktecha, it means to turn to. God says, you will turn to your husband. And for her to have to turn to her husband, it's because it'd be like this here. If you're... If God is talking to you, you're facing God, and He says, you will turn to Him. He's talking to her. Do you see that? He's not talking. He didn't come to her, Adam, in the, in the patriarchal way of doing things, and comes to Adam and says, look, your woman messed up, and you need to let her know this and this is going to happen to you. No, she is facing God. He is discussing the matter with her, what she did. He tells her, this is going to happen to you. You're going to birth sons. That's going to happen to you. And now you're going to turn to your husband. And he, and shall, he shall rule over you. You know why he rules over her? No more Spirit of God. No more Holy Ghost. He's now a carnal creature. I also want to say, notice future tense. He shall rule over you. That means he didn't <clears throat> do it before. He, they were created equal. They were co-rulers. Let them rule. Mm -hmm. See, they were co-rulers. They had the same assignment. And it's, and it's, they were partners. Not one above the other. Not one commander and the other one who obeys the command. You that was not obey? in the creator. That was Sorry. not in the original <laughs> creation. Right? But notice the future tense. He shall rule over you. Now you shall it's, turn it's to prophecy. him. It's prophecy. Again, it's a prophecy. Right. Now he and it's based on consequence. Exactly. You see what I'm saying? He, he, they both lose the Spirit of God. And because of this, she has consequences, just like he has consequences. Right. Now, before we go to getting into the other things, let me just, one thing let me clarify. This is, you have to look at what does God have to do to restore everything back. Now, we immediately think of, well, Jesus has to come. Yeshua must come and restore back man in his fallen condition because man sinned and God has to send a man to get it back again. But there is something that got left out. It took a man to fix the problem that Adam messed up. But before God could fix the problem of what Adam messed up, the issue of what Eve messed up has to be repaired first. And unless that's repaired, you can't get the man to come. Right. The man has to be a kinsman redeemer, like Boaz was the kinsman redeemer. He has to have a kinsman redeemer. But Eve made one mistake. She reasoned with the word of Almighty God. And because of that, Satan was able to deceive her. She tried to figure it out. And that's what got her in trouble. Now, when Abraham comes along, even though God knows that Abraham and Sarah are still going to make a mistake, and it can't be corrected there, although he's going to bring forth the promised seed through Abraham, but it's kind of interesting. He comes to them, and he speaks about that he's going, they're going to have a child, a promised son. Now, even before the Lord comes and says that, he's already told Abraham he's going to have a son. And it's going to be by Sarah. 
And then he comes and actually tells them in person, they're going to have a child, I'll visit you according to the time of life. And this time next year you'll have a son. And of course, what does Sarah do? She laughs. She, laughs. she doesn't believe it. What does God name the child? He laughs. He laughs. You know why? Because he left before that time, before Sarah did. But Sarah was actually meant to fix the problem that Eve did. Even though God knew that she wouldn't, it's still in type it was there. And what was the problem? She did the same thing that Eve did. She didn't believe it. She didn't believe it either. And she reasoned with the Word of God. God tells her as well as Adam, you're going to have a child. Sarah's going to have it. But when she looks at her body, the circumstance, and she thinks the time of life has passed, man, I'm going to have pleasure with this old guy. That's just funny. And then she says, well, I'll tell you what. Maybe God meant Hagar. <coughs> and he gives, him, gives, her, gives, wait a minute, gives him, Hagar, her handmaid. Which because of her sin there of unbelief again brought a bunch of Ishmaelites in the picture and caused our people a lot more trouble. <laughs> Just like what happened back in the Garden of Eden. Mm -hmm. But, and we're going to come right up to this and then we're going to go into the... But who fixed the, it? What woman fixed it? But that's the point. There, was a woman there has to be, there, in order to fix this, in order to get a kinsman redeemer, Eve's mistake must be fixed. God was looking for a woman that would believe his word and not doubt it. And Mary was the one. When the angel of the Lord come to her and said, you will be with a child. Was that any different with Abraham and Sarah? Was it not an angel? Not only, it wasn't just one. God himself comes down to Abraham with two angels. I mean, God comes down himself and they both are laughing about it. And you know what I find interesting about this? God makes them name the child Yitzhak. He laughs. You know why? Because what Israel thinks is funny is the way God is going to bring the Savior. What you think is a joke, God will bring your Savior. That's why Paul says that the man is not without the woman because he brought the promised seed through a woman that believed and corrected the mistake. That was only the first mistake. And then Christ had to come and fix Adam's mistake. Now, without Christ, neither one of them would make it. It wouldn't matter if, if she believed it or not or corrected that mistake. Without his death, burial, and resurrection and him willing to do what he did, neither one. it wouldn't have mattered all she'd done. It would have been in vain if he didn't go the full way. Exactly. And believe well, God's word. Is still our redeemer, our woman's redeemer as well. Yeah. And it restores back that relationship. Now, here's the thing, though. Here's where it comes in the big picture. And I want to bring up first one of the comments that Paul makes in, I believe it's Corinthians 14. I can't remember for sure if that's the right place. And I like to speak about this myself because this is... This deals for me with Genesis. And what brought all this up was when my wife, what caused her to really start searching for herself was when she was in the Watchtower Society, was a man comes in there and he begins to, to preach on, women got to obey, get in line, submit, do this, do that. And it really caused her, I was there the day. Well, I want to tell you a little bit about Watchtower Society, how they treat women. Because on the outside, it looks like they treat them nice. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're going to tell men, you need to love your wife, you cannot do adultery, you need to have one wife. And that's all cool and good. But when it comes to spiritual life and spiritual gifts, they deny this to women. Okay? They abuse them spiritually. Okay? And then it transfers to the physical. A lot of Jehovah's Witness women are abused by their uh, husbands who are Jehovah's Witnesses. I mean, I have seen it as a child. I have seen men smack a woman in front of everybody, give her a... Like the Catholic Church, they hide pedophiles? Uh, and will not they're hiding them. pedophiles. They're having horrible sins that are hiding. They also have hiding. Jehovah's Witnesses also hide them, too. 
That's what I'm saying. They both do that. You're right. Right. And they are viewing women. You know, they are going to headship doctrine, which I don't know even if people have time. This is really deep. But they're teaching that uh, God talks to men in a family, okay? And men decide spiritual matters in a family. And the woman is to follow. Now, in a kingdom hall, she cannot pray loud. Her voice is, she can lead in a prayer, okay? She cannot stand in front of audience and read the Bible. I can't read you that way. You cannot, as a woman, read the Bible, the Word of God. You cannot even go on a podium. I used to be so afraid to stand in front of people and talk for like many, many months. I was like, oh, I don't know if I can do this because as a Jehovah's Witness, I was always told I'm only the listener sitting down and this is only for males. <laughs> I'm out of the cam, sorry. <laughs> okay, so, and when they come to the podium, they are doing this training of how sisters gain believers at the door, how they gain converts. They use them for that. Females are used because they're good talkers. I, I, can I, can they, I stand? We can't see your head. Oh, I'm sorry. I can, if you want to stand, I'll move the camera. No. Um, women, you know, women talk, and, and when they get passionate about their religion, they really do. I mean, there are so many Jehovah's Witness women that are so passionate about their religion. So they use this woman virtue to send them out to the doors, and they're used for converting people and bringing them into Kingdom Hall. But even men, they can talk to men outside there, that's fine. But once they're converted and they're in the Kingdom Hall, that's over. They cannot read the Bible out. They cannot pray. And if they need to, for some reason, that we don't have a qualified brother, you know, then they have to cover their head with something to even prove. Even if it's your son. Even if it's your 10-year-old son whom they happened to baptize, and he is in the audience, and you're reading some Bible out loud, you have to have a head covering Even on because your, your son home. is baptized brother now. And you are less than him. And you don't talk to God. Only he can. And if you do talk to God, then you have to put something on the head so everyone knows you are out of duty. You're doing something not assigned to you by God. That's literally. And I had a problem with that. You know, I really had a problem with it. I believed every single thing in that religion. I would die for it. Literally. I would go to fire for this religion because I was brought up in it. My mother was a pioneer and I was so strong in it, going door to door with watchtowers and giving it to people and converting and talking to them and arguing with Christians and reasoning. And I would do it my whole life. But I had a problem with that women part. I truly did. And then one beautiful day, I almost, well, that's a long story. I, I yeah. can't go into it. Because we want to do it more mini because we are as late as we are. We want to at least get it the first time out, and then we can come back and go into this in another conference. More yes, detail. so I went um, to that particular meeting. It was in June of 2010. And there was a brother, Jehovah's Witness ex-brother from Immokalee, Florida, who came to give a talk about authority. And he talked about authority in the world, authority of the government. I don't know if you are familiar with Romans 13 and how they teach the, that we, ha we have to obey the government. Now, there's a problem. There is a misrepresentation there too. Okay? But then he went to the family, and then he really went very hard on women, very hard. And he took one scripture, Ephesians 5.22, which said, wives, submit to your husbands in everything. And he read it, closed the Bible, put it down, and then he started his long, long speech about women and head coverings. And we are basically good for cleaning bathroom, making sandwiches, making sure men are okay. But we got to go out to the doors to make bring converts in. Okay? So... Yeah. Yeah. Before you go further, let me just let me just share another thing as well. When we were in North Carolina, up with Brother Paul and, and Brother Austin and Brother Doug there, we were in the conversation about this as well. And up there, I'd actually spoke about the Genesis account and showing how that God had not made the women inferior. But afterwards, the next morning, I'm sitting there with Brother uh, Brother Austin and and uh, 
and Brother Doug and and Brother Austin said to me, he says, but you know, Brother Steve, I, know, I, I believe that. I said, I can really see where God has created women and, and men equal. He said, but still, we still have our separate roles. He said, the man is the priest of the home. I said, but Brother Austin, if you can show me that in Scripture, I'll agree with you. And I said, let me just share this with you so it'll make sense to you. I said in Corinthians where it talks about that the man or the man is the head of the woman, God is the head of Christ, etc. As you know that right there, right? And I said, I'll just kind of paraphrase. And he said, yes. I said, that word in, in Greek is from the Koine Greek language, language is called kephale. It in English you translate that as head. And maybe in ancient or old English, it may have made more sense if you were living back then, but it actually in Greek means source. That's all it means. Source. It has nothing to do it's boss. with the being the boss. It is the source. Now, take the word of God in Hebrew, where God took Eve from Adam, out of him. See, so when he says that that. The man is the head of the woman. In other words, the man is the source of the woman. He taken Eve out of there. He's telling you what happens in Genesis. Then he says, God is the head of Christ. He is the source of Christ. He, why? Because Christ come from the bosom of God. Then, here's how you know that he's talking about this. He goes like this. He said, and neither is the man without the woman. He's not talking about because you're born from your mama. In other words, Christ couldn't have come if it wasn't for Mary. Again, it's all dealing with the source of redemption. And this is what, and so in saying this, I, Brother Austin, he goes, I, I never knew that. I said, most people don't, brother. I said, because the churches don't. I said, the churches that you know that are teaching lies and trying to keep you held down and have withheld all kinds of Bible truths <coughs> all through the years, they wanted to keep this suppressed because they want to shut women up because they're afraid they might learn something and they may not have the control. And then the Pope will not have his hierarchy that he has now. He has to keep it hierarchy that way because then it won't work if he doesn't have it that way. I said, and secondly, brother, I said, think about it in this regard here. I said, if submission is what you think it is. And by the way, I said, I'll take you to that word is where the word submit in the, is not even in there. Well, there is, well, it is. I it's when he says you it. submit to one another. That's there. But when he says, when it says in there, Hus our wives submit to your husbands, they injected that assuming that it should have been implied. Now, I wait a minute before you get there. Let me, let me get to the part of Brother Austin, okay. and you can bring that up. Yeah. So I told him, I said, no, Brother, I said, now, now you want to think about the reality of this. If, indeed, it is mandatory of a woman to submit to her husband, as the way we have been teaching it for the ages. I said, at one time I thought the same. I said, I'm no different than you. Mm -hmm. I said, I didn't just come out and become a chicken. You know, I, I had to see it for myself. And, you know, I understand Hebrew, so I know what it said in Hebrew. It just seemed like, well, it's like the two contradict each other. Because I knew what Hebrew said, and I knew it didn't say what Paul was saying. I mean, I thought, well, Paul, maybe he's off his rocker. Most Jews think he's off his rocker anyway, so it's no big deal to us to think he's off his rocker. We know he don't know what he's talking about. So I asked him, I said, if that's the case, and all the women are subject to their husband, and the only way they're going to please God, and I've heard this quote-unquote in Pentecostal churches, and, and only because I visited them, I'd never attended or joined any of these rascals, but, but the thing, that's right, but the thing is, they teach you that you are serving God by serving your husband and being submissive to him. I said, how many denominations you guys got? I said, no, they're not part of the denomination, but Brother Austin knew what I was talking about. I said, brother, all these cults, all these cliques, all these clans, and I said, these women are obeying God's word by being submissive to him. If that's the way it is, they will all end up going straight to hell because of a lie. That's because all these men, like for example, that, let me ask you this question. If a woman submits to a spiritual leadership of a Jehovah's Witness, is she going to heaven? Is she going to be saved? 
Search out your own not. salvation with trembling exactly. and fear. Exactly. You see, if that was true and that was the way of God, it would be only in one sense. You know, God is perfect and loving. Okay? If all men were always right, 100%, and women were some kind of dumb and don't know any better children, all their all lives children, because this doctrine infantis infanticizes women, like we stay kids the whole life. We are just children that always need direction and we can't be on our own, okay? That's what this doctrine does. But if that was true, that men are always right and they have only, the only, you know, part of humanity that have spirituality and they know it all and then women don't know any better and they all have the same doctrine and they all know Yeshua and it's the, you know then I would understand that we were created you know we are just we need their direction and we need their you know but look at all these cults look at Catholic Church Pope is a man okay priests are men how many millions are being led Look to Look at hell? Jehovah's Witnesses. Look at Mormon men. And they are all teaching this doctrine to their women. So the woman is thinking, well, as long as I follow the spiritual direction of my husband, I'm doing God's will. No, you're going to find out you're not. And you will face God one day. And he's not going to save you because you obeyed your husband. Let, let, me, let me just inject another thought, too, because all kinds of things come up to us, especially if I get into this subject. And it's easier when I talk about it because, you know, even though brothers might disagree with you, and, and, I, and I know, I know you brothers will probably no doubt go search this for yourself, and you've got to because you don't take nobody's word for it. You've got to go search it for yourself because if you don't, if you're not convinced in your own heart that it's right and it's the word of God, then it, you'll, it'll never do you no good either anyway. But you got to, I had to search it for myself. I had to see for myself that that was so. You know, I don't have to have a Hebraic scholar tell me about Hebrew. I'll tell him about the Hebrew. You know, we'll butt heads over that one. But on the other side, it's different. But the, one of the other big things that come up was, then you hear him say, well, wait a minute, wait a minute, brother. Whoa, 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 whoa. Paul said, I suffer not a woman to teach or serve authority over the man. What you going <laughs> to do about that? When you go back in the Greek language and you see the way it's written, they have a certain little symbol that puts the questions that are brought to Paul in like a quotation mark. Well, that one, that one actually wasn't quotation. The other one was. Okay. All right. Well, this let me just let me go into this Ephesus here. Church. Yes. He's dealing with the Ephesus church. I, yeah, I, can, I know that part too, but I realize that they have the margins and stuff like that yeah, as well. Right. But in this case here, what, what Paul is dealing with in Ephesus even historically speaking, I've got a friend, Dr. Hutt, who is, who is a Greek scholar and knows this stuff better, not from reading the Bible, from reading the Clementine writings, which are the ancient books that were written about Paul, written about Peter, written about Jesus, secular writings. And they were always saying, Paul is so liberal. I mean, he was breaking every Orthodox Jewish rule there was, and most people think it's just the other way around. But what was Paul dealing with? Now, this is not the Clementine writings. This is what Paul actually is talking about here. In Ephesus, they were dealing with the doctrine of Diana. Mm -hmm. And there was this one woman that was coming in there and shouting and screaming. In a violent manner. In a, yes, in a violent manner. Okay. And Paul, in Greek, he never says, I suffer not women to teach or to serve authority over men. He says, I suffer not that woman to teach, One nor to woman. assort, not assert, but with you violence understand? over a man. Because he's using the word authentail in the Greek, which is used only one time in the Bible. And that word in the secular writings was used with the way that women priestesses served and preached about Diana Artemis. She was a goddess in Ephesus, okay? And she was a goddess of fertility. Oh, that's, now, that's another Now, let me point. tell you, yeah. if you read the entire passage there. She shall be saved in childbearing. It doesn't say saved in there. It doesn't say saved. It says safe, okay? It's safe in childbearing. And why? That's their doctrine. The doctrine, well, let me explain this, because in Ephesus... That's cheating. ...was really... I thought I was the boss. Okay. <laughs> I'm just kidding. We take turns, honey. Remember? 
know. Nobody is a boss. Fear, we, are, you know? we are really <laughs> one. We are one. <laughs> we are one. But, okay, let me explain this Ephesus thing. There was a doctrine of Diana, and even in a book of Acts, in certain, I don't remember exactly which chapter and what scriptures, but it says when Paul and Ta uh, Timothy came, they caused havoc over there, right? Like real problems, and people started screaming for two hours, great is the goddess Diana, great is the goddess Diana. And it's there. In, so we know in Ephesus was a real problem. In fact, the Ephesus church didn't survive because of that. They got overtaken by this horrible cult. And the uh, big statue of Diana was one of the seven wonders of the world. Nasty. It was a really, and, and you know, she has multiple breasts everywhere because she was a, a goddess of fertility. Now, her priestesses were women. Oh, by the way, that's, uh, that's her, no, that's not her face on Starbucks. That's the goddess from Egypt, isn't I it? guess so, yes. Anyway, but I like Starbucks goddesses. coffee, but I might, may, might change, you know, I might just kind of, yeah. Never but mind. anyway. Different story. Exactly. Now you're breaking my memory I'm here. I'm sorry. <laughs> but anyway. The goddess was the goddess of fertility. That's where you left Yeah, she off was at. a goddess of fertility, but uh, she had priestesses uh, in a temple. Okay, and men could get to her only through sexual orgies with those priestesses. Violent sexual now, orgies. Now, the way, if you read about it, read about the history of it, and then you understand what Paul dealt with, what he dealt with, and what Timothy dealt with in that particular city. Now, um, the way of point. sex that they did together for to worship Diana was extremely violent, and it was led by women, wicked women, okay? So apparently, if you read the entire chapters there, Timothy is writing to Paul, and he's complaining what's going on. There's many teaching wrong genealogies. You can find that. Do you remember that? He's complaining about wrong genealogies. You know what that was about? Because the cult of Diana was teaching that women originate from some kind of super, super women. They were created first. Not men, but the women were created first. Now they never see. sinned. Mm -hmm. yeah. They had a special knowledge and they were enlightened. That's the teaching of Diana religion, okay? And because Diana is a fertility goddess, every woman who does not worship her will die during childbirth. Okay, so what was Paul doing? Why was, well, he's setting things straight. He's saying to Timothy, and now it makes all sense. He's saying, I do not suffer that woman, singular in Greek, and particularly that one. That woman, apparently, you see, Paul's letters is like one, listening to one uh, side of the conversation on the phone. <laughs> like, I know what you are saying, honey, but what is he saying on the other side? You right. know, many of his letters, we don't know what he's answering because they were written to him and we only see the answers. Okay? So he's saying, I, don't su I suffer that woman not to teach, and he doesn't say having authority over men. The word authority is not there. It's not exosia. That, yeah, that would be exosia would be an, a Greek word for authority, but it says otentel, which is a violence. I suffer her not to go with violence over men. Apparently, she was coming, screaming, yelling. He calls her a woman. Look at Paul's letters. How does he addresses our sisters every time? Collaborators in the gospel, sisters. Beloved, never calls them women, women. He doesn't. There is something out of his style. Something different is going on. Okay? I suffer not that woman to come and scream and be violent over men. And those genealogies that Timothy is complaining about. Because it's not the woman that was created first because the... Man was created first, and woman was in transgression. She was not enlightened. Okay? So now you're dealing with and both And now, sides what is, so equation. he's kind of setting things straight. And what is he saying? Hmm. And tell them that women will be safe during childbirth. Assuming that they are in Christ. Not I mean, saved. How are you going to get saved 
bringing we are not children. saved by having children you're doing away with the blood of Jesus Christ completely if that's the way you're okay. getting saved so they are basically in churches that are taking this scripture alone they take it out they don't study history what was going on in Ephesus they don't study a uh, word study in original Koine Greek and then they created this doctrine that all women at all times cannot teach the word of God Paul never said it was a word of God Timothy is complaining about different gospels and false teachings. Read the whole thing. Timothy says, some of, uh, some of them infiltrated congregations and they are teaching false doctrines. And he's addressing those false doctrines of the some that infiltrated the congregation. And it happens to be that priestesses, that woman, okay, that was not our sister. And he's setting things straight. So to take that little part out without doing historical background study, without do understand what Diana religion was about, without looking at entire context, okay, and with looking at Paul's style of approaching believers in Christ as brothers and sisters, beloved sisters, co-laborers with me in the gospel, okay? So we have to... You see, we are responsible to really explain the word of God properly because then what happens? The encoded message gets wrongly decoded and we have abuse of scripture and we have spiritual abuse among the body of Christ. Because even the phrase, he's the priest of the home, is totally unscriptural. There is only one priest high priest. That's Yeshua. Mm -hmm. And when it comes, when you are in Christ, we are all priests unto God, mm -hmm. even women. When he fills you with his, with his life, with his Holy Spirit, you are the priest unto God. Because you can go alone to him. You don't need a man to go to God. Yeah, your man is your partner. You get together and you worship him together. But you don't need men to be your priest. So the, that phrase is actually not found in the Bible. Because there's only and one it's a wrong phrase between Christ and man. God is calling me to talk to daughters of God. He wants you. He's jealous of you. He's not telling you not to love your husband. Love him. Give your own life for him and serve him. Submit to him in a Christian way. And do you want to know what the Christian submission is? Ephesians 5.21 says, submit to one another. Mm. Ephesians 5.22 says, in Greek, wives to your husbands. It doesn't repeat the word submit. The word submit is not there in original Greek. It was added by translators. Mm. So therefore, the verb submit has to be drawn from which verse? 21 to make a sense. You cannot read Ephesians 5.22 by yourself and get away with it. Because what you would read is this. Wives to your own husbands. Do what? <laughs> okay. Well, we got to do, in, in, in Greek, you got to go to, Ephes to Ephesians 5.21 and draw the verb to the verse 22. And then you know what you got to do to your husbands. Okay. Submit to one another in the Lord, wives to your husbands, because husband is the head of his wife, the source, the origin of his wife in Greek, and so on, so on, so on. And then it speaks about husbands love your wives, okay? And there is a big section on loving. Now, you know what the word love is there in Greek? Agapeo. The word agape. You know that's unconditional love? Do you know that no matter what you do, he's called to love you? Okay. And then he and says, the, the word Christ. agape, that, that Paul is saying to love your wife, in the Greek language, is a synonym to the Greek hupotosomai, to submit. Did you know that? They mean the same thing, said two different ways. Let's take Meaning you are one. And you submit to one another. 
And the whole message of Ephesians 5 is about oneness and love. It's not about who is in control and what is the chain of command. Because Paul knew Christ. He knew him. He met him one-on-one. -on -one. You agree with me? And he would never go against Christ's teachings. And when his apostles argued who is greater among them, Paul has said, whoever wants to be first, let him be the very last and a servant of all. That's what Jesus taught. And to teach primacy, supremacy, and chain of command is not of the Lord. It's a religious spirit. And what it causes in a body of Christ that contains men and women filled with Holy Ghost. Do you think that in the time of Pentecost when Holy Ghost descended in the form of the tongue of fire, the, the Lord said, oh, the women will have pink fires and the, and the men will have blue and then women will get a gift of making sandwiches and the and men will gonna go and, and speak about God and lead everyone. The same Holy Spirit was given regardless gender because God is no respecter of persons. And once you get to know Yeshua and you receive Holy Ghost, you are his ambassador and you are given authority, not over one another, not over your husband. You are no more than your husband, but you're given authority to speak for him, to preach gospel and authority over wicked spirits. That's right. That's your authority. And you both have that. But not authority. over another human being. You don't have authority. Mm -hmm. And this is what I'm trying to tell men who would listen. Do not belittle your wife. She speaks with God just as you do. Okay? So this doctrine of headship, by the way, the word headship does not exist in the Bible. There is no ship to the head. Okay? <laughs> That's a made-up doctrine by men. And it's been teaching in seminaries, and a lot of pastors are just really ignorant of it. They know it because it's how they were taught. That's right. But once they go, and I have that experience, when they go to Greek, when they really study Christology, all you have to do is study life sayings and, and works of Jesus Christ, and you will get it right. And then if you know that Paul knew him like that, you will understand that, well, let me go to Greek, what he really said, because I can't believe that he would be putting some new laws and regulations on women when the original word of God doesn't say that. I mean, in a Ten Commandments, which is not a law, by the way, that's not law. Do you understand Ten Commandments is not a law? Ten Commandments is commandments, it's the sayings. Okay, of God that is perpetual, never ending, and will be there forever. Why can you ever kill your brother? Ever? No. Was it nailed to the cross that I can't kill your, my brother? Every single thing of the Ten Commandments was written by hand of God on a stone, and then it was written by hand or finger of God on your heart. Ooh, ooh, ooh. <laughs> now. <laughs> Let me get, we'll get an amen with that one. I'll take, now, conjecture. I believe this is why Yeshua drew in the sand. He was demonstrating to the Jews that he was the same God that would took his finger and wrote the Ten Commandments on the stones. And now here he was writing them on the table of the heart, the sand representing the stone, as the stone has become soft in the sand. Yes. And when they under conviction that everyone walked away. Yes. See? Yes. And I know we've kept you guys this after midnight oh, I'm sorry. Now, and I could so. go because I'm sure you might have a lot of questions. There is about five or six scriptures that need to be explained. And it needs to go deep. And always look at what, what did Jesus do in his day? Oh, by the way, we had a lot of women apostles written in the Bible called oh, apostles. Did you know Catholic Church that don't want you Junia to know that. Apostle was a woman until 14th century on the original Bible? She was an apostle. And oh. Paul, Paul referred yeah, to her, but that. one of the most noble apostles was Junia. Well, Catholic Church in the 14th century, when they went on the killing women as witches, they changed it to Junias. Uh -huh. So now he's a man. Uh -huh. 
okay? So these kind of things have happened to hide that in Christ we are one. When Paul wrote Galatians 3.28, there is neither Jew nor Greek. Yes, and there is, there is neither male nor female because in Christ we are oh. all one. Let me, let, me just, let me just share with you one last thing. Jesus, I believe it's Jesus said this himself. I don't know if it's him or if it's Paul, but he said, except that you're willing to forsake mother, father, Jesus. brother, sister, husband, and wife. And take up, I think it's take up your cross and follow me, then you're not worthy of me. So if he meant for you to be, as it's been translated, that you must submit unconditionally to your husband. And I know some people, some really good-hearted brothers that believe that, that don't, just don't know any better, they would say, well, you know, we don't believe in submission by force, it's just by love. And I understand and, that. But the, by the way, we do believe in Christian submission to yeah. one another, and you are to submit to your husband in a way that Christians are submit to one another. Now, when I was talking about Ephesians 5.21, submit to one another, 5. 22 says, wives to your husbands. The verb is drawn from 21 to 22. It's not a new word with a new meaning. How do, we su how do I submit to you, brother? How do I submit to you? He says, submit to one another. We do I make you my boss? No. No, we edify one another. Exactly. exactly. We tend to each other's needs. We put yeah. others ahead of us. Wife is to do it to her husband, but it says to one another. Husband is to do it to his wife. They are submitted to one another. Well, even when he says love your wife, it's the word agape. And he says even Christ submitted to us to the point of death. I mean, he submitted his own life. That, and that's the ultimate submission. example of submission. You understand? The Christian submission is different than the submission in an and English word. He never made us obey him. No. Mm. And he never... With love, he wants he us, draws us to do that, but it's by love. It's not yeah. by, you either obey me, buddy, or you're going to get the axe. He's, no. He doesn't do it like that. You know, so I know we kept you. You guys, anyway, you there is any a lot, but just think of Yeshua. That. Think of his sayings. Think of his commandments. Whoever wants to be first, it's a man or a woman. There are some very bossy, bad women. Okay? Whoever wants this, remember, you are very last, <laughs> very last. And a servant of all, you must be. Because he says, he came to serve us. And he asks, who is greater, the one who sits at the table? No. Or the one who comes and serves the one who sits That's at the table? Wash the feet. Exactly. He came to wash the feet. And, and we, we are to submit ourself. to one another. We keep that custom. I think you are higher than me. I think you are higher than me. I think he is higher than me. I'm to submit to him as to my brother in Christ, as to my husband and my lover. I love him as my partner. But he is not my priest. He is not my spiritual leader because Yeshua is my leader. He, I am ambassador for Jesus Christ. That's who I am. And I speak his word with authority. Because he gave me Holy Spirit. That's and this who I is am what in Christ. Redemption does. This is, and that's one reason why some people say, "Well, I thought it was only men were priests back in the Old Testament." You have to remember, redemption had not been fulfilled yet. But yet, well, even with that, God still had Deborah as a judge over Israel, anointed and called of God. Do you know? Let God me tell you a little says, bit about "Wait a minute." He says, say "Wait a minute." But wait a minute. <laughs> Glory to God. Okay, I submit. Thank you. <laughs> Go ahead. Anyway, God says something very interesting. He said, I sent you, Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. Yes. Not just Moses. He, God, that's out of his own mouth. And he includes Miriam. Miriam. And he didn't say that she was sent to, 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 to wash the dishwater. No. <laughs> but she was called. And she was a prophetess. Yes. Hmm. 
you know. That's another thing, fivefold ministry. You know, teacher is the very last one in hierarchy. The first one is apostles. There was apostle junior. There were prophets on the number two list, right? Prophet speaks for God. His mouth is used for God's word. We have female prophets. We have even female apostle in the Bible, which was junior, according to original manuscripts, without changing of the Catholic Church. Okay? Then we have evangelists. Do we have female evangelists? Yes, we do. Then we have pastors and teachers, and these are the two offices that they don't want to give women because they can't teach. But yet teacher is the lowest one. And if they say, well, I'm only a servant, well, can't women serve? Can't we serve? We love to serve. We're good at it. The first, let me, let me oh, I got two more I want to share real quick. And you guys already know this anyway. The first person to ever speak the gospel of Jesus Christ was a woman. And her the apostles, because they came through a patriarchal system of Israel, did not want to believe her testimony because she was a woman. She was the first one that saw me in prison. And Jesus abraded yes. them well, for not, hang on, uh, for not accepting and believing her testimony. He said, why didn't you believe her testimony? But he said something else, why and, you didn't believe her? Because I sent her to you. Okay, now, mm. here's another one for you. And this is only a shadow and type. When Moses came to the well, Jethro, Jethro, his daughters, seven of them, who type the church, the bride of Christ, they are shepherds. Yeah. And who is driving their flocks away from the well? But men shepherds. You ain't got no business being a shepherd out here. And they drove him back from the well. But Moses stood up for him. And he drove back the shepherds. Restoration. He brought you back to the place. He gave you his life, your spirit. Mm -hmm. You no longer have to turn to your husband. You can be partners with him. But now you should have a relationship one on one. I mean, otherwise, how are you going to get the Holy Spirit? With Yeshua. Are you going to wait for God to get permission from your husband? Can she have it yet? Do you Does know why? Do you know why he's? I don't know, Lord. She ain't been very submissive with me here lately. <laughs> Glory to God. I tell you, I wouldn't give her nothing. <laughs> I mean, God don't run His business like that. No. This is a religious spirit. This is what Catholic Church did, created hierarchy with the women on the very bottom. Oh, and by okay. the way, that's the other thing in the prophecy. We're, even though we're trying to help people to understand this, and we're not the only ones, there's others out there that do it. Yes, there but is. But the, the thing is, and there's a lot of scholars that are starting to wake up yes. and realize this yes. as well, biblical scholars that are starting to say, wait a minute, we've got to tell what the truth is. But, but the problem is, is God already prophesied that there's going to be enmity, hatred between you between the serpent and the woman. So that's why women have always been hated so much down through the ages. And between your seed, Christ, I mean, not, I'm sorry, the serpent's seed, and the woman's seed, which is Christ. So it's a double whammy. And this is why you see that Christ had so much love for women. He broke all Jewish customs. That's why his disciples says we, they didn't dare us ask him a question why he's speaking to that girl at that well. Because you didn't do that, boy. That was against every commandment Moses ever gave. I can't believe he's talking to her. Yeah. He was, he said, I have a need. I would have a need to go by Samaria. There was a reason to go there. And, you know, of course, he goes ahead, go get your husband. I ain't got one. I don't need him. But by the way, you had five. And the one you're living with now is not yours. She says, sir, I believe that you're a prophet. And we know when Messiah comes, that's what he'll do. How did she know that? How did she know the Messiah would have that kind of sign? Because of the story of Abraham. He knew the secrets of the heart. 
God bless you guys. We need to close. It's, it's really deep, and I hope it blessed you, and I hope I didn't offend anyone from uh, my brothers because I love you, and I think you're higher than me in Christ, and I would wash your feet. So um, I just really want to bring up what God dealt with me. He brought me out from organization of Watchtower based on women issues. He showed me Greek. And then I wasn't even worried about who Jesus is at that point. Um, but uh, I thought Jesus is Archangel Michael, by the way. That's the way that they teach us. Uh, I mean, told us. In that way, Mormons, you have some Mormon background, you said? So just a few years. OK, well, years. who is Archangel Michael? He's a brother of Lucifer, because there are angels, right? So Mormons teach that he's a brother of Lucifer. So it's actually the same doctrine differently painted, if you, you know, think about it. But uh, then one day, I was in, at home, and we had really big, big marital problems. If you want to uh, read our story, go to the website, and there's Yana's blog, and I'm writing my testimony. I still need to write more. It's in parts, and because I'm writing in a great detail yes, over there. Yesrealreturns.com. Yes, it's in, on a card, by the way. But um, I want to tell you, this part will finish. And one day I am at home, and I was seriously doubting now that they are teaching correctly. And I was, why, was saying to myself, you see, when I found out about women, I went with excitement to my sisters in Jehovah's Witness organization. I said, i got to show you something. Uh -oh. I have to show you this. I mean, this is so great. You know how great is our God? And then when I showed them that, they're like, Yana. <laughs> You're going to be in trouble. Big trouble. And if we... KGB trouble. We won't tell on you, but just don't continue this. Whatever you're doing, close it off and come more to the house-to-house -to -house ministry with us. Well, I went home very depressed because I knew that I'm discovering truth in Greek. I mean, I was just awesome. Well... The very soon after, uh, uh, one day, I mean, um, it was August 23, 2010, and I was uh, at the computer, and there was this man by, from UK on YouTube, and I don't even know how I got to that YouTube. I really believe it was Lord who drove me to it. But there was a name, a uh, man, uh, his uh, nickname was Shazulu. And he happened to be a man in the UK who had a ministry to Jehovah's Witnesses. And he was a Christian, evangelical Christian. And he is saying, looking at the camera, and he was like looking right at me. And he's saying, um, Jesus died for you. He died for you. These eight men in Brooklyn, New York, they didn't die for you. In fact, do you know their names? What do you know about these men? <laughs> they write your doctrines. They tell you to do this, this, this. But they didn't die for you. But there is one who did, and that's Jesus Christ. And he's the way, the truth, and the life. And he's the way, way to God. And he was preaching basic gospel that I needed so much. He was giving me that milk I didn't have, you see. Well, something happened at that moment to me. It was just like well came off my eyes. And I saw that I have missed my Messiah, that I have never seen it. I read it many times, but it was just this reading. It never went in a heart or anything. You know, it was just there. I repeated the words. At that very moment, there was this awesome presence in the room. It was like a light and a warm blanket over my body. And it was a very supernatural experience. I can't put it to English words for you. There is no words for it. I don't know how to describe this experience. All I can tell you, Jesus came to me to save me. And he came to me. This is why this message, you need him as your spiritual leader. Um, I went on my knees. I wept because the, 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 the feeling of love was overwhelming. It was a love from another dimension that I have never experienced in this dimension. Jesus was right there in that room with me. And I wept and mourned 
for denying him for so long. I went on my knees, I wept, and I cried out, Jesus, you are my God. Well, I always argue with my husband that Jesus is Archangel Michael. And so he was at work, and I was so weeping, I barely could see. But I was texting my husband, and I said only this, Jesus is God. <laughs> That's all I said. Because it was like instantaneously I knew that I missed him, and I missed it all. And he's all I need, and I don't need this man, okay? The man that brainwash me and he came home about 30 minutes later with like dozen of red red roses and mm -hmm. since that very day our marriage was restored he was sent to ministry a few weeks later I started learning and I was born again mm -hmm. and there is even more details if you don't have time but I never entered Kingdom Hall again but who took me? I was, it was Yeshua himself. I mean, he came, literally came to me. His presence in a room, that blanket of warmth on my body. And, and it was just something amazing and supernatural. And um, he became the lover of my soul. And I'm truly in love with him. He's everything to me. And the second person right after Yeshua is my husband. Yeah, so that's right. But anyway, I love you all, and God bless you. And um, thank you.